Welcome. This is a fantastic turnout. Um, David was afraid no one would show up. <laughs> uh, David Ives is probably best known for his evenings of one-act comedies called All in the Timing and Time Flies. All in the Timing won the Outer Critics Circle Playwriting Award. <laughs> David, David also travels with his own laugh track. So. Um, <laughs> we're this introduction. Um, uh, All in the Timing won the Outer Critics Circle Parenting Award. It ran for two years off Broadway in, in, uh, in the 1995-1996 season. was the most performed play in the country after Shakespeare productions. His full-length plays include Venus and Fur, which recently enjoyed a vast critical and audience success off-Broadway, New Jerusalem, The Interrogation of Baruch de Spinoza, which won the prestigious Hull Warner Award, Is He Dead, adapted from Mark Twain, Irving Berlin's White Christmas, Polish Joke, and Ancient History. He's translated, he's translated Fado's classic farce, A Flea in Her Ear, Pierre Cornet's 1643 comedy, The Liar, and an hit this past spring at the Shakespeare Theater in Washington, D.C., also winning the Charles MacArthur Best Play Award at the Helen Hayes Awards, and Moliere's misanthrope under the title The School for Lies, another large hit which premiered at Classic Stage Company in New York this spring. David Ives is also the author of three young adult novels, Monsieur Eek, Monsieur Eek, Scrib, and Voss, and he has adapted 30 American musicals for New York City's beloved Encore series. A graduate of Yale School of Drama and a former Guggenheim Fellow in playwriting, he lives in New York City. I first met David uh, when I was a Lark Playwrights Fellow, Workshop Fellow, back in 2007. His critiques were always kind, enlightening, and spot on. I remember at one point I brought in the latest section from a play I'd been working on, and we all heard it read aloud. After the reading was finished, he asked me, so how far into the play are you? I told him that that part took us up to uh, page 70. He asked me what the play was about. I told him I had no idea. And his reply was simple and concise. Uh-huh, was all he said. Some more feedback from others was given, but I could tell David wasn't finished. He finally blurted out, but where's the dramatic arc? Where is this going? Again, I, had, I, had, I answered I had no idea. David paused a moment and then dryly concluded, I would look at that. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So I was always kind. <laughs> you were. Um, I, I did look at that and I concluded that the play was going nowhere, so I started a new play the next day. But since the time that Gary asked me to host this conversation, I've been poring over David's plays, some I was familiar with, some I was not, and it occurred to me as I was getting uh, what seemed to be a master class in crafting comedy, that David Ives knows exactly where he's going, and it was such a fun journey to go along um, uh, with him these last few weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Ives. So you were saying you actually wanted to talk about drama today. Yes, we're not talking about comedy. Okay, good. <laughs> just to be perverse. Um, I think we should just get to the crux. Where's the dramatic arc? <laughs> Where is this going? Uh, let's get to the crux. Just tell us the key to crafting good comedy so we can all go back to the hotel and start writing. Um, okay, next question. Um, good. Um, so let's talk about all the timing. Uh, okay. Let's start at uh, the beginning. Um, and you just mentioned this in the, in the car on the way here. I love the use of the bell. Oh, yes, the use of the bell. Where did that come from? Because you use it in other places as well. Where did that come from? Um, the bell the, actually gets laughs. The you bell, know, bell, the yes. bell is a character. Yes. The bell is a character. You can uh, start with first with all of us. Okay. Um, what? In, in, uh, <laughs> uh, sure, take that one. <laughs> <laughs> the only one in here who does not know about the bell. Please, <laughs> Please, man, what are you doing in this hall? Uh, uh, money back. Um, uh, the bell, the bell, and all in the timing. There, um, all in the timing was a series of six short plays, uh, several of which employed a bell in various ways. The most famous one, I suppose, is a play called Sure Thing, in which two people, it's two people sitting at a table very like this, a, a guy and a girl, on a on a lonely night out. They don't know each other. 
he strikes up a conversation with the woman, and every time one of them says something which is completely wrong in terms of ever getting together, a bell rings and they start all over. And so um, uh, that, that is sort of the use of the bell. Um, where that came from was, <clears throat> I, I actually wrote the idea for that play down many years before. I, in a notebook I wrote, I wrote down just this, a play which is a conversation that shows all of the possible conversations two people can have. And so I sat on that for the longest time, and then one night I just thought, oh, I sort of, I think I know how to do that. And so I, I sat down and I started writing, but I didn't know, I knew that the conversation had to stop and start, but I didn't know how to stop and start it. So I, just for the, just for the, just to sort of mark time for myself, I, I thought, oh, well, I'll put in a bell, and then I'll figure this out later on. And then I started laughing every time the bell rang. And so I, I just kept the bell. And um, so I wrote a bunch of bell plays, but um, unfortunately for me, or for the bell, um, I, was, I once ran into Stephen Sondheim, and, um, who, who, whom I know somewhat, and, and he turned to the person he was with and he said, this is David Ives, he writes the plays with the bells. <laughs> and that was the end of the bell. And I, 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 he didn't know, he didn't know he changed my career. As, as, I have you, not as you changed, changed mine. As I have not changed his. But, um, but he, um, he changed my life, and, and so I threw the bell out the window that very day, where it's lying nine stories below my apartment this very minute. And so that's, that's the story of how the bell came to be. It was, it, was, it was sheer chance. It was improvisation on the spur of the moment, which is how a lot of those little plays got written. Had you ever considered using a gong after that, possibly? Um, well, I used a fight bell in one play, but <laughs> that was as far as I was willing to go. Um, great. You have so much fun with language, uh, to the point where you even created one of your own in that uh, hilarious one act, The Universal Language. But even more than language, uh, you seem to have a fascination with the way we communicate or fail to do so, as is so often the case. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just be the straight man. I'll set them up. Okay, you know, yeah. <laughs> we rehearsed that in the car on the way here. <laughs> exactly. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, I know you're a great observer of people. Um, when, when did you first realize that uh, this, this fascination with language was going to net you millions of dollars? <laughs> Who? I'm sorry. I don't know what you're to. Um, actually, I, I have to be perfectly honest. I, 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 um, I think that a lot of those early plays, um, which the woman in row 10 does not know about, but um, a lot of those early, thank you, take a bow, take a bow, thank you. Um, a lot of those early plays are concerned with language in one way or another, like the universal language, right? I, I wanted to create a play that was, I wanted to write a play that was made in gibberish to see how much fun I could have and how much an audience could understand what people were saying, even though they were speaking in gibberish. And so, uh, for a time, I was, yes, fascinated by that, but I, I have to say that I don't, think I'm, I don't think I'm writing those plays anymore. I think language went the way of the bell. And um, <laughs> Stephen Sondheim said, this is the guy with David Ives who writes the plays in the English language. So I, <laughs> so I swore off the English language and decided to pursue other, other means instead. But um, I, <clears throat> I don't quite... Yes, I was, I was concerned, as I think actually a lot of young playwrights are. It's like when you look at early Pinter, you know, he, he's very concerned with that, and he, he kind of moves away from that later on. He actually gets involved in human beings. Um, and so I got more interested in human beings at some point than I was in language, and so I, I, I don't think I write those plays anymore, but tonight that all could change. Let's hope so. Um, based on this conversation. Exactly. We can only help. Um, this is just a personal question. Are you not a Philip Glass fan, or was your play Philip Glass Buys a Loaf of Bread an homage? Uh, I don't know. I, I, uh, I wrote a play for the lady in, the, in row 15. Uh, I wrote a play called Philip Glass Buys a Loaf of Bread many years ago, which was one of the plays in All in the Timing. It's five minutes and 38 seconds long, and it relates, it's, it's four people in a bakery, one of them is Philip Glass, and, and it, it turns into this 
a cappella Philip Glass opera with them repeating only the words that they have spoken in the play. And so it's this little enclosed madcap um, riff on what Philip Glass does. And I, I, I wrote it as a, certainly as a send-up. But you know, you can't send somebody up without somehow acknowledging what they do. Otherwise, it's just pastiche. And so, um, also, it, for those of you who may know the play, there's a little dramatic story. There's a dramatic arc in the, in the story. It's about time. <laughs> and, and so, in the five minutes and 38 seconds, Philip Glass goes from meeting a woman that he was in love with to pondering the relationship they were in, all in repetitive syllables, and, um, and then sort of seeing the end of the relationship. And so um, I used it just for fun, but I, again, like the universal language, I, I wanted to write a play that, that was musical to the core without having to call in a composer. And so I rem well remember sitting in my little apartment tapping out the rhythms at one o'clock in the morning of this play and for what it would sound like, and I'm sure my, my neighbor thought I was insane because I was doing this. But the, the, um, one, of the, one of the things that happened with that play, this, uh, this was in the years when I was having a lot of, I would have a one act or two done at the Manhattan Punchline every year, and um, uh, they had a little comedy festival which was invaluable if you wrote 10 minute or 12 minute or 5 minute and 38 second comedies. And so um, I remember writing the play and being petrified because I was taking it into the producer to look at it, to submit it for that year. And the, the Manhattan punchline was basically a Xerox machine and an artistic director <laughs> going bankrupt. That was the, you know, all that he owned was the mustache on so his face. So it was face. a theater. <laughs> he owned the mustache on his face. And, um, and so I was petrified that he was gonna, he was gonna go, what the hell is this? And so I, I brought it in and I said, Steve, I've got a, I've got a play I'd like to submit for this for the, for the comedy festival this year, and he took it from me and he said, Philip Glass buys a loaf of bread, I'll do it. And he, and he put it on his desk and that was it. I said, don't you want to look at it? He said, no, I don't need to look at it. But if he had opened it, he would have seen this mass of columns of people speaking in verse, you know. And so, um, always have a good title, I guess, is the, is, the, uh, is the moral of that story. Well, good, which leads us into the next uh, question that I have for you. Because um, one of my favorite one acts of yours is soap opera. And it's a play that actually is an episode of a soap opera called All the Days of the World of the Lives of All Our Children. <laughs> In which a Maypole repairman brings a washing machine into a French restaurant for a quiet romantic meal. Is that, it's realism. It's, absolutely. Um, now this is probably your most pun laden play. I think. I can't, I can't answer. I, I, okay, it is. <laughs> uh, and you use them to such great effect. So I'm guessing you're not one of the many that feel that puns are the lowest form of humor. Uh, no, but actually this, this play was based on the fact that I had a quite long relationship with a household appliance for some time. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's actually autobiographical. <laughs> if, if there are any puns in it, they were completely unintended. Right? <laughs> I, I love puns. I, I, I have to say I'm, I'm cheap enough to employ them at any possible turn um, because I love to hear audiences groan and, uh, <laughs> and, and if you can, people, who, people who look down on puns, I look down on. And so, um, it's reverse psychology. Yes, yeah, the hell with that. <laughs> um, let's talk about that play a little bit. Okay. Um, it's, uh, yes, it's about a, it's about a, 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 a Maytag slash in the play Maypole repairman who has a who falls in love at an early age with the Maytag in his basement and tries to reenact this childhood uh, memory. But he falls in love with, with um, he becomes a Maypole repairman and falls in love with a washing machine who torments him, of course. And, yes, and then there's someone inside the, the machine that actually is the voice of the machine. Yes, there's, a, there's, a, there's an actress inside the washing machine who comes out who is the goddess of the washing machine and torments him. Um, yes. And so the, the, the repairman shows up with the machine at a French restaurant yes. and has a conversation with the maitre d' yes. asking for a table. <laughs> and for two. <laughs> um, and then we... Uh, 
we, he, be, he explains to the Major D, basically, we see his relationship with Mabel, yes. who was a woman, and that didn't work out. Yes, he, he had been in love with, a, with an actual woman named Mabel. And so the who always had a stain of jelly on her, yes, her shirt. She, yes, and so she was stained, whereas the Maytag, the, May, the, the, Maypole, the Maypole washing machine represents purity, you know, nuclear purity in its, in, its, in its most advanced form, whereas Mabel is, is impure. And so it's a flashback, you see. Um, okay. Very sudsy. Yeah. It is in the sudsy, and, and it goes in cycles. Uh, there's so many wonderful <laughs> puns. There is one, the, kind of the closing barrage of puns happens where he names every major detergent. All cheer, uh, tide. The tide has turned, but for all. Uh, but be of good cheer. And, you know, it's, it's, it is so grown worthy. Yes. Um, and uh, at that time, um, or at that, at that point in the play, we're, we're almost finished. I just, uh, I, I just love that play so much, um, and I just wanted to hear a little bit more from you. Um, sadly, I never got to see Venus in fur, but you told me it was excellent, and I believe you. <laughs> I was only quoting other people. Exactly. Well, I read the reviews, and, and they said the same thing. What drew you to this novel from 1870 by Leopold von, what is it? Zacher Masoch. Yes. Uh, that led Pretty to funny, the, huh? Yeah. Zacher Masoch. Put that in your place. It's, auto, it's an automatic laugh. <laughs> yes, okay. what, Leopold von Zacher Masoch. <laughs> <laughs> what led you to, to this adaptation? Um, for those of you, for the lady in row 15, um, <laughs> uh, she's moved back to 20 now. <laughs> crawling under the chairs all, as she goes. Um, I, uh, for those of you who've never heard of Venus and Fur, Venus and Fur is probably the world's first and possibly, well, was for a time most famous s and porn novel. It was written in 1870 by a, by a fellow named Leopold von Sacher-Masoch, who gave his name to masochism in the, um, in the clinical directory. And um, it's the story of a relationship of a, of a it, it's a, sadomasochistic relationship in, 18, in Vienna in 1870. And, um, uh, sounds like comedy to me. No. Um, <laughs> what, what can't we turn into comedy? Uh, in any case, Venus and Fur, I turned into a play a couple of years ago off-Broadway and, and um, a two-hander about uh, an actress. It takes place in, in contemporary New York. It's an actress young actress who is auditioning for a play for the part of Vonda, the woman in Venus and Fur, and she is, she is auditioning for a playwright who has not been able to find the woman to do this, this sort of arrogant young playwright. And what happens in the course of this single act play is that, is that, the, is that as they act out scenes from the play, they progressively start to reenact Venus and Fur, the novel in which there is this there is this back and forthing of power and submission and and um, and so uh, where that came from was that actually um, I had I had another idea for a play which was some years ago I, I don't know if ever, if any of you know the know the, the <coughs> sadomasochistic porn novel called the story of O which was quite famous for you know and still is it's a it's a really extraordinary. French novel, quite gruesome, but, but very pure. And, and I'd always been fascinated by that book because of its purity. It's this, it's this woman who enters into a relation, into this submissive relationship, and goes sort of, it's almost as if she transcends the world through, through um, this submissive relationship. And so I, I had this idea of how to turn that into a play, because I thought it would be this beautiful sort of performance piece. As it turned out, luckily for me, the rights are completely unavailable because everybody has wanted the rights for the last 50 years. And so, since it was on my mind, I, I just thought, oh, I'll pick up Venus and Fur, which was sort of the earlier famous s and pornographic novel. And as I read it, I thought, this is a great play because it is two people locked in a relationship where you never know who actually holds the power. And since plays are, you know, almost every play in some way, comedy, tragedy, any, any play, is about shiftings of power between people. And, um, and so this play seemed to me to crystallize a relationship and a love relationship. And so I took 
I sort of took the play, and the, the book, and I, and I adapted it. I adapted it straightforwardly into, a, into a, a, a play, and I gave it to Walter Bobby, who was my longtime collaborator director, and, and he, we have a, an extraordinary friendship, relationship, collaboration, whereby we just, we just speak our minds, and he read it, and he said, I have to tell you, I don't think this works. And I, he said, I can't tell you what to do with it. I think there is something here, but it's too literal, and it doesn't feel like it has anything to do with today, because it was set in 1870. And so I just took that, and I sat on it for about six months, and then I just start, I just sat down with, with the adaptation, of the literal adaptation of the novel, and I just started stripping away everything that was not drama. And everything that was not confrontational, everything that was not, everything that was not an exchange of power or an ambiguous moment in the relationship. And once I'd stripped that away, I had these extraordinary moments of, of drama. And I don't quite know how I came to it. I thought, what if, what if, what if two people have to act this? And so I, I, I put them in, a, in an audition room, and I locked two people into a room where a director and an actress who are in a natural position of power submission at every moment are enacting a play about power and submission. And so that's kind of how that play began. Uh, and it, it, uh, it, it just gripped me at a certain point, the story of two people, uh, which, became, which are actually four people, of course, because they're not only playing themselves, the actress and the director, but they're playing the two people inside, so it's a play within a play that they're doing in this audition room. Needless to say, with tragic consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when you talk about stripping, uh, I know there are a lot of people that, not when you talk about stripping, when you talk, <laughs> when you talk about stripping things away, I know there are a lot of people that do adaptations in this room and are interested in talking about that. Um, and this isn't on my question sheet, so we're going, we're, we're this is a risk, okay. Sure. Um, what, what's your process? Yeah. Do you have? Do you? Do you? Um, do you storyboard? Do you? Um, do you have note cards? How do? You, how do you go about keeping track of things when you're discarding so much? Um, I, it, uh, I, I. I seem to have turned into an, an adapter in, in in the course of my life, but I, I take solace in the fact that Shakespeare actually was an adapter <laughs> since 35 of his works out of 37 were actually adaptations, and so I, when I lie awake at night, I, I can take solace in Shakespeare. Um, but when, I, when I'm adapting something, for, I'll give you an example. I, I recently had a, I had a show in New York this past month called The School for Lies, which was my adaptation of The Misanthrope by, of Moliere. And um, uh, I, I had just done a play in verse, The Liar, here in Washington at the Shakespeare Theater. And so I had, I, had, I had done one play in verse, and I wanted to do another play in verse. And the head of the of classic stage came to me and said, is there any play you'd like to work on to translate or adapt? And I said, well, I've never, I've never liked The Misanthrope very much. Why don't I work on that? <laughs> and so, um, and, and I, mean that, I mean that quite seriously. I, I, I know that this is heresy, but I am actually not a huge fan of Moliere and never have been because I, I'm never satisfied by his plots. You always felt Corneille was a better, uh, a, a better well, I, I feel I feel like Corneille speaks to me because Corneille was a, was a greater human being in that his plays, Corneille's play, Corneille preceded Moliere by some 20 years or 25 years, but Corneille to me was the end of the Baroque, which is the end of Shakespeare, which means just which is to say plays of enormous humanity and enormous understanding, and to me Moliere is a playwright of a very narrow understanding. To, you know, he's, a, he's essentially sending up the world. Corneille was interested in understanding and appreciating and celebrating the world. And that's why I, I'm a fan of Corneille and why I had just done Corneille's play The Liar at Shakespeare Theatre of Washington. But I've always been fascinated by The Misanthrope um, as a great play that's never satisfied me because, it all, because there's not enough plot to it. It's this extraordinary relationship of a, basically a curmudgeon in France in 1666, and, and a society woman who is completely <coughs> superficial, a gossiping, uh, a gossiping hostess. And it's their, it's their love affair and how it falls apart, so it's sort of a tragic comedy. And um, 
that is an ex that to me was was a plot uh, was a story that I wanted to tell, and that's why I really wanted to go to the misanthrope. And so I had to think once I'd said that, and he said yes, why don't you adapt the misanthrope? I had to think about how to go about this. First of all, I knew it had to be in verse because Moliere is in verse, and actually for me, if you if you take Moliere out of verse, it becomes a sitcom. There's you know because it's it is it, it is levitated by the by the wonderful verse of Moliere, I must say that his verse is, is quite pure. It's like, it's like Racine, almost. But, um, um, so I knew it had to be in verse, and I knew what the central relationship was of this, of this curmudgeon and this woman. And so what I started doing was, I started doing to the play all of the things that Moliere would have done to the play had he lived another 350 years and been me. Um, and had my taste, and, and, and wrote in English, and had a production of Classic Stage Company. And so, what I did was, I took, I, I wrote on index cards, actually. I, well, I took notes and notes and notes, thinking about these characters, and, and what, I, what I wanted from them. Because the French tradition is so alien to us that French classical comedy rarely works. And so, I thought, this has to be a Shakespeare play. It has to be, it has to have that kind of size, it has to have that kind of um, broadness of various experiences. The, the misanthrope is quite narrow in its concerns. And so what I did was, after I had, I took notes for two months just sitting at the computer and sort of noodling and letting my subconscious go, and then I took index cards and I wrote down all of the scenes that are in Moliere and I laid them out on my dining room table and then I took other index cards and I wrote scenes that I thought were missing. It's like, how, I've always been fascinated, how do these two totally unlikely people fall in love? And what's funny about that? And so I, I, I wrote on a card, uh, he, meets, he meets Sally Men, who is the woman. And so I started, I, I really plotted that adaptation the way one writes a screenplay where an, I, I kept writing cards and moving them around my dining room table until I had a story. And, because story to me is the hardest thing in the world. Um, it's, it's easy to make people talk once they are in a dramatic situation, but if I don't have a dramatic situation, I'm, I'm lost. And, but once I had um, curmudgeon meets society hostess and falls in love with her, I had a scene of, that was potentially funny, potentially moving, potentially romantic. And so all I had to do was plunge in. And so I wrote a sort of literal prose adaptation of, of the play that I wanted to write. And then I translated that into verse, which kind of was another whole process. But, but in adaptation, I have to know where I'm going or, or I'm lost. I'm not, a, I'm not a writer, even when I write my own plays, that can, that can noodle on no idea. It's like I know Harold Pinter used to get drunk, go home, write down, write down a line of dialogue and just start writing. And I can't do that. I'm, 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 I, I don't have that. I need people in a situation. And one of the things I love about Shakespeare, since I'm on this subject, and, and one of the things that informed adapting Moliere, is that Shakespeare always begins in drama. There is, you're always in the middle of the situation. I mean, look at the top of Othello. Look at the top of King Lear. Look at the top of Hamlet. He starts with drama, and then he catches you up. And so I need that. I need to know what, what is going on in the scene. And then you can, you, you, you're, you're there. You, you don't have to do any work, really. You just have to put people, you know, give them a name and, and, and um, let them continue in the scene that they're in. Are you, and, and I'm remembering something back from the LARP days. Um, I think, aren't you, uh, the one that was talking about, we had a conversation one day about writing the last scene, knowing where you're going, or having a sense of where, how the play is going to end at a certain point uh, early in the process? Yes, I, I've never, I, I don't think I've ever written any play where I didn't know exactly where it was going to go. Um, and even though the middle of the play is, can be a great fog, um, and there are things to be filled in, it's like in the, it, when I was adapting The Misanthrope, I didn't, there's a, there's a subplot about some uh, letters that are being used to sue somebody. And it wasn't until I was in the middle of the play that I realized, 
who had written the letters and to who and how they fit into the plot. And I remember standing up in my writing room and like turning around, you know, my writing room was tiny. But it's like I stood up and I just turned around and around and around because I had found this, this piece. So little things like that, but I knew where that play was going to end. Even when I wrote a, when I wrote a, a my 10 minute plays for all of the time in those other plays, I really, I really would start out knowing the destination. But you know, it's like you, you know you can, you know you're going to Buffalo, but and you can go to Buffalo by way of Boston, or you can go by way of San Francisco. But you, but but knowing Buffalo is the important thing, actually. Knowing Buffalo Minus is to play. die, is to die. <laughs> uh, let's talk about why recently won a Helen Hayes Award. Congratulations. Sure, thank you. Um, in the preface to the play, you tell of how your agent gave you this 17th century farce by Corneille to read, and you describe your reaction to it. You write, I found myself astonished, exhilarated, giddy, for lying on the desk before me was one of the world's great comedies. I felt as if some lost Shakespeare festival comedy on the order of Twelfth Night or Much Ado had been found. This particular Shakespeare comedy was unfortunately locked away in French. The French have a way of doing things like that. <laughs> but I could remedy that. The prospect of Englishing this play made me feel like Ronald Coleman distantly citing Shangri-La. <laughs> You told me that you had maybe more fun writing this play than any other play you've ever written. Why? I, I Talk did us have, through that. I did have more fun writing that play than any other play. Um, partly it was, the, it was the joy of discovery that when the Shakespeare Theatre of Washington sent me, my agent the play. I'd never heard of it. Nobody I knew had heard of it. I'm sure you know, none of you have heard of it, um, or very few of you. But, um, they sent it to me in French. Well, yeah, someone knows. The lady, the lady back there knows. <laughs> um, uh, but this, but reading this play was like it was as if the mid, as if mid, somebody had given me *Midsummer Night's Dream*, but it was in French, and and so I was so delighted reading it that I knew I had to I had to do it, and it was I had never worked in verse before. It was in verse, and I had to learn how to how to write in verse, uh, which was another joy because you see what happened was that lear learning how to write iambic pentameter and in fact iambic pentameter couplets. What I would do is every the, the play just took me over, and every day I would walk down the street and translate anything I saw into iambic pentameter, and I would translate the times into I you know headlines in the times, and I would look for rhymes anywhere I was going, and so this play just took me over, and I was I was just constantly scribbling in the street, things that I was things that I was realizing, and every morning I would begin by reading out loud about 20 minutes of Shakespeare to myself, reading some some of his sonnets or something from one of the comedies, to see how Shakespeare manipulated iambic pentameter into speakable verse. Because I knew that it couldn't be Shakespearean in the sense of that kind of long Baroque line. We, we tend to work more, you know, our speech is in shorter lines. In fact, one of the th interesting things I found out about, speaking of crafting comedy, is I realized that iambic pentameter, which is ten syllables long, you know, lines of ten syllables long, is actually too long for comedy. Mm -hmm. And so I came up with a little ditty, which is, since wit works best in short, quick pokes, pentameters not made for jokes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because actually what I found is that punchlines in our, in our era tend to be actually eight syllables or shorter. And so that's why they're called punchlines. And so I had to find a way to fit punchlines into a ten-syllable ten line, which was another part of crafting comedy. But the thing about The Liar, let me tell you what The Liar is about, and you'll see why it was so exhilarating to work on. The Liar is a play from 1643, a comedy about a young man who comes to Paris who is a pathological liar. He will lie about anything. You, you ask him the time of day, and he will find a way to lie about it. And so the play is constructed simply out of a plot made of misunderstandings caused by his lies. But his lies are a page long, and they're in this beautiful, rippling, silvery verse. And so it was an opportunity to just fly very high on, on, on the poetry, on the lyricism, because really, obviously, what the play is about is about, is about the artist, because the artist gets through the world by making things up. And so 
Once I knew that, once I knew that it was truly about the gift of imagination and the power of imagination to make this absolutely amoral young man get through everything that goes wrong without any problems. It was, it's, like, it's like being levitated with a plot like that. And so that's why every day was a joy. And so I was never happier in, in all the months that I was working on it. And that's why it was fun. Because I was learning a new language, which is verse. I was in a great play. I was inside a great plot. And I had wonderful people to spend my days with, which were these French people from 1643. And uh, I have a copy of it right here, because you just gave it to me. Um, one of the things that's so wonderful about this play is, uh, and it, it, it's interesting, we, in Stephen Schwartz's uh, session this, this morning, we were talking about um, the license you take in an adaptation. And once you have the rights, it's yours, and, and y you should be able to do what you want with it. Um, and so I, I didn't know what to expect um, when I, and David sent me a uh, digital copy of the play so I get to read it on my computer, but um, this is the opening of this uh, 17th century play. Ladies and gentlemen, Madame, Monsieur, all cell phones off, all cellophane secure. Finish your texting now, not during my scene. I'm in some theater, but like, where's the screen? No eating, please. You think you're incognito? Yes, you, the lady with the bean burrito. <laughs> Put it away. I have a crucial, crucial message. This guy looks worried. Whoa, what does this message? Anyway, um, I knew that I was in for such a treat uh, when I read that. And because I honestly, uh, with all of the stuff that's been going on here, I thought, oh, and I'm going to have to carve out some time to read a 17th century <laughs> French farce. Um, it's a it's a wonderful play. It's just so much fun, and you have such uh, such a good time with the language. Uh, I'm glad we got to talk about that a bit. Um, anything else you want to talk about? No, I think that's good. Okay, let's go. Um, so you call the liar a translaptation. Yep. Please explain. <laughs> well, I don't. Uh, I you see one of the things that I've uh, discovered about adaptation, and I'm speaking truly of adapting plays and adapting plays by playwrights who are dead. I think we owe nothing to the play that we are adapting except to make it dramatic, funny, speakable, and producible. I think that one has to take any steps in order to do that. And um, uh, I think, and this is, this is what I came to about translation, which is that I realized something that I had never realized in all my decades of laboring in the theater, which is that in a funny way, language is the least important part of a play. Because, I mean, look at somebody like O'Neill. O'Neill's dialogue is often hewn from lumber, you know. It is often <laughs> the, most, the most ungainly dialogue in the world, but what magnificent plays he makes out of them because of what is happening between the characters, because of the situations that they're in, the relationships that are that are being enacted in front of us. And so what I realized in, in, tra in translating and adapting is that you have to translate the play, which is not the language. The play is the network of relationships, comic, tragic, whatever you like, <clears throat> that's going on between people. And what you have to find is a language that does everything to support what is going on underneath the play. In the same way that when I was adapting The Liar, I realized this is a play about lyricism and imagination. So everybody's language had to be had to rise a little. It had to be a little, a little, um, you know, it had to ripple more than than regular speech. And so, but but every scene had to had to hold its own dramatically. And so I changed scenes and in. in in the misanthrope, I certainly, you know, I added scenes to what Moliere had, and I changed the plot a bit. That's because you have to look at what the playwright had on his or her chest when they were writing it, and what is on your chest when you're working on it. Because if there's not something on your chest when you're adapting a play or translating a play, it's not going to work. I can tell you that. Because just as when you're writing your own play, you are writing it both because of the people who are on the page in front of you and because of something that you've got to get rid of or get off your chest. And so, Corneille was saying something that, that I realized I had on my chest, which is the power of imagination to conquer all obstacles in, a, in, in the best of circumstances. And so, 
Um, when I say translaptation, that's what I mean, is that you have to go underneath the play and see what was intended. What is the, what is the drama here? Translate the drama, and the language will take care of itself. And so it is really a process of analysis, and that's why I say I had to, I had to sit at my computer and take two months of notes to think about how these characters worked, what they were, just as if I were creating a play of my own, so that I understood when I sat down to finally write them in English and in verse, what their, what their speech was and how they talked and where they came from and how they were related to each other and how my language would enforce that, absolutely. That was a good answer. <laughs> um, let's talk about New Jerusalem, shall we? Um, I read in an interview that you said, and I quote, I read that Einstein in his old age was asked if he believed in God, and he said, I believe in Spinoza's God. So I picked up this book called The Courtier and the Heretic, and I thought, my God, this is an amazing story. How did it proceed from there? Um, New Jerusalem is a play that, that was on about three years ago in New York at Classic Stage. It's, it's a drama, and fundamentally it, it, is, it concerns itself with the day in 1656 when Baruch Spinoza was excommunicated from, from, the Jewish community, from the Jewish community and from Amsterdam, when he was banished from Amsterdam. Be and I'll tell you why it seemed dramatic to me. And if I keep harping on the word drama, you may notice that I said that to Jim, where's the dramatic arc? To me, a play, you know, I work on a play when it feels like everybody in a play is connected to the central drama. And when I read about Spinoza, when I read this book about Spinoza, it just seemed to me instantly dramatic, and here's why. Spinoza was a 24-year-old merchant in Amsterdam, which was the, the freest city in the world in 1656, ever, had ever been. You could practice your faith, you could be Jewish, but there was like a tragic hook. A Faustian bargain had been made by the, by the Jewish community in 1656. They were mostly from, from Portugal and Spain, and, and the city of Amsterdam only allowed them to practice their religion freely if the Jewish community policed its own people for heretics. And so, in 1656, word got out in the Jewish community, which was very tight, that Baruch Spinoza, this young man who was a merchant and a and sort of favorite son of the community, that everybody thought he was going to be the next chief rabbi of Amsterdam, he was so religious, word got out that he was passing around unorthodox opinions. And the city of Amsterdam went to the Jewish community and said, you have to stop him in any way you can, or we will stop him. If that's not dramatic, I don't know what is. Also, because Spinoza's mentor was the chief rabbi of Amsterdam, who expected that his student would, would certainly never be passing around orthodox opinions. And what I read in this book was that on this one day in 1656, Spinoza was, was summoned to his synagogue, and he was questioned by his community about his beliefs. And nobody, there is no record of what was said inside that room. But what, what we do know a couple of facts, one of which is that his, his mentor, the rabbi, was not there that day, but was across town. And when he heard what was happening in the synagogue, he rushed across town and he cursed his own student. He cursed Spinoza. And at the end of the day, Spinoza was, was ejected from the Jewish community which meant that no one could have any contact with him, not his family, not his friends, no businessman, nothing. No one could, could come within five feet of him, in fact. It was the harshest excommunication in the history of the people of Amsterdam and remains so to this day. And that piece of paper still exists, which is a curse on Spinoza. And the, the, the city of Amsterdam banished him from Amsterdam. And so here you have a character whose entire life changed in one day, a young man of 24, who was cut off from everything that he knew, and whose community had to cut him off, and whose city had to cut him off. And he changed Western civilization, because he is, of course, one of the great philosophers in, in, in the history of the West. And so I read this book and I thought, what in the world was the scene like 
in that synagogue that day. It just felt instantly dramatic. And so I, I started constructing who had to be in the room that day. And so it had to be Spinoza. It had to be his teacher, the rabbi. It had to be his sister from his family. It had to be his friend. And so once I had this little nucleus of people who, were in, who had to be in the synagogue, making them speak to each other was actually an extraordinary experience because they are forced to speak because everybody, not, nothing that, anything that anybody does in that room affects everybody else in the room. And that to me is drama. That to me is when everybody is complicit in an action, whether it's comedy or tragedy or, or melodrama, a musical, you name it. Everybody has to be connected to the action. And so that was how that play came about. And that's, that's really what I mean by drama, is that, is that you are in a situation where people are forced to reveal themselves. And that can be comedy or it can be, it can be drama. I like to say that um, comedy is about people scrambling and tragedy is about people getting scrambled. But in, in, either, in either case, the, the, the story has to push them to reveal themselves, to interact. And so that, that was how that, uh, how that came about. Fantastic. Um, I, I did write a question down that I don't think we want to get into. Spinoza believed in determinism. Do you? That could be a very long conversation, yes? Uh, I, I can actually give the answer to that that Isaac Bashevis Singer did. Isaac Bashevis Singer was once asked, um, Mr. Singer, do you believe in free will? And he said, do I have any choice? <laughs> Good answer. Um, so you write in a dark room, correct? I write in a dark room. Actually, I, I have this little writing room in, my, in, in our apartment. Um, and I actually put black wallboard over the window to make sure that it was dark enough. Because that's just how I've, I've learned how to write. I, I, when I was young, you know, when I was writing and when I was in college, I would write in the middle of the night. And so I just got used to that, I think. But it's not a prescription for anybody. I don't recommend putting wallboard on your windows. Um, you write usually from after breakfast until around 2, correct? Yep. I, I have a schedule. Um, I, I, have, I write every day, except days like today. Um, Sorry. I write every day. Uh, and I, yes, I write from morning into the middle of the afternoon, and then I take a walk, and then I, if I have work in the evening, I do that. But that's really the fundamental writing time. But it's kind of sacred. You know? And uh, what, what happens with the rest of the day? Are you a, a, do you go to the museum, the, the yeah, opera, the ballet? Like I, take like a walk, I, take, I take a walk in the city, and I keep my ears open, and don't use a cell phone or an iPod, and just listen to what people are saying. Um, and. Uh, I, I have to, in a funny way, I have to say, I don't take my main inspiration from the theater for what I do. I, I always take my, 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 I'm inspired by music, I'm inspired by poetry, and I'm inspired by painting, I would say. And so, yes, I wander over to the museum. But um, in a funny way, going to the theater now, I'm so aware of theater tricks that I, watching plays is very hard because I'm, I'm sort of watching how things are positioning. And so, um, I find, I find other ways to be inspired. Okay. Uh, it occurs to me that some of you may uh, have to go to other events at three. Is that correct? Anybody going? Great show of hands. People that have to go someplace else. Go ahead. Great. Shall we let Let's them? Let's take a little break and yeah. then we'll come back for questions. Yeah. Well, I, have, I still have some more. Oh, yeah. And then questions. We'll do lots of questions. We'll so back. take, take we'll be back in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Wow. Well, <laughs> 